Three, two, one. Hey, we are back. And yes, we, I have a special returning <laughs> superstar guest host. Those of you guys, those of you guys who listen every day, yep. you know, you know, Julie had a, uh, a forced uh, week off because of the lovely Saharan dust storm basically kicking her ass. Exactly. Yeah. So she's back and um, she's mostly, uh, I would say, <laughs> she's mostly mentally here, but we'll see. And if she's a little bit dopey, then you guys will have fun listening to me as I mm-hmm. try to pick on her, see what I can get by her. Mm-hmm. But, nice. but in the meantime, welcome back. Thank you. It's always good to be back. Missed you guys. And, uh, you know, took a little break from some of the media, which actually was sort of a nice thing, but was. then uh, coming back to some interesting news. And as I was uh, you know, dealing with the whole Saharan dust storm, which honestly I did think was a joke when I first heard about it. And I'm like, okay, so first of all, we live in the Caribbean, the Sahara's in Africa. How are we dealing with this? But it's a real thing. And some of you guys that live in the Southeast are probably dealing with a little bit of that as well. Is so, your uh, dead cat thing on? Okay, yeah, it uh, is. But at any rate, what I was thinking is, you know, it stinks to have your... Uh, mind thinking a certain way when your body's not cooperating or possibly vice versa and how many people go through that with various ailments and things that they're recovering from and maybe they're just tired you know a lot of people say oh I'm so exhausted I'm so stressed out and I'll never forget an article I read about that that said you know probably you're just dehydrated so drink a lot more water and you're going to feel a lot better but the point that I'm trying to make here with my allergy medicine kicking in. I know. I'm interested. This, yeah. this, I'm, I am I'm, going somewhere. No, no. I'm, that's going to be fun. That, it's a fun journey to see where this rambling is yeah. going to end up. Hey, don't pull so hard, well, right? Yeah. So the thing is that sometimes your mental and physical states don't match. And instead of being complacent about that, you have to go do something about that, right? And it could be something really simple. I was talking to one of our friends here you know, during the, um, the whole lockdown where... Nobody was allowed to do anything and people were getting really frustrated. And um, she said, you know what, no matter what, I put on my earrings every day. (laughs) She said, that's my, one of my minimum standards. It makes me feel like me. And I I try and wear a different pair of earrings every day. And I I want to at least do that. And then she said, and if it's a really good day, I'll do my nails, (laughs) you know, because she's trying to like uh, center herself and, and not lose it and have a, just something she can control. And I think that's the overall thing. And I, I was listening to your podcast as I was recovering from earlier in the week, the normal podcast, and you were talking about control the things that you can control and stop wigging out about the things you can't control. Environment, physical, and financial. So exactly. go, you guys can go back and listen to the, the exactly. podcast that I did over the past week. And by the way, thanks to all of you guys and the great feedback, especially on the ones about the moral obligation to be rich. But I digress, Julie. Well, so my thought was, you know, on some days for some people, maybe the one thing that you can control is a physical aspect. But the answer isn't to just give up on everything. You've got to build on something. And then once you've worked on that, you know, it's like if you look in the mirror and you smile, even if you don't feel like smiling, something comes over you and you start to move forward. And I remember in like in the real estate treasure map and 90 day massive action plan and some of our other podcasts where we talk about have a plan. That doesn't mean you have to know every single step of the plan. How many people don't get started because they don't know all 16 steps and maybe the 14th step intimidates them. You don't have to know all of that. You just have to take the first step, the second step, because probably the steps along the way are going to change anyway. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, at the end of the day, it's we always reference back to military things. Right now, more than ever, guys, it's incredibly important that you stay in your own, you know, three foot world, basically, Mm -hmm. where you're not literally thinking or acting outside of more than about three foot, three feet around you. Stay small, stay completely laser focused. Um, because really, it always comes back to those three things that you can actually have some sort of control over, not complete control over any of these things, but you can mostly control these things. Um, and if you're feeling a lack of control, if you're feeling, you know, uh, here's the recipe. It's very, very simple, really. Well, it's simple to say. Uh, number one is obviously you want to go media free. Julie talked about how it feels not actually being part of the, you know, conscious world of insanity right now, which seems to be everywhere. So go media free. Number one, just completely and totally purge all forms of media. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm listening to um, a couple books. You know, I always listen to two or three books, but I really honestly, guys, other than real estate news, and Julie and I don't even read the news. We have our Google alerts. If you don't know what Google alerts are, you should set them up for yourself. It's pretty cool. Basically, you put in keywords. You should put in your name as a keyword things that maybe your town, community, whatever, things that are important to you that you want to know about. Right. 
And then um, Google will send you articles or that, you know, could be articles, could be videos from YouTube. It could be, you know, podcasts, whatever, that are using those same keywords. And then you can sort of stay ahead of the curve. And we've done that for years, uh, helping yeah. us stay ahead of the curve. on. And it filters out the crap. Yeah, yeah. and it filters out. Exactly. And then you're not having to, you are the one deciding ultimately what you're going to be reading, not some, you know, screwed up algorithm on Facebook. So just for what it's worth, it's a very powerful way for you to stay ahead of the curve. Um, but yeah, that's the only source of news that Julie and I even consider. And we're just reading about the things that we're interested in reading about. And we're staying clear of all the other things. We're not immune to the hype and the fear and the panic. I mean, we were driving, I drove, I drove Julie down to a medical appointment this morning on Sunday. And, you know, they want to do a recheck on her. And we got caught in a parade. <laughs> we pulled off the freeway. And, you know, we're driving into downtown San Juan. And downtown San Juan's a downtown and not the downtown sense that you might be used to but there still are buildings and it's an old historic area and there's you know it's very very congested and lots of you know those types of things but here we were stuck in this what was it it was a a parade and what do they call it spirit week spirit week spirit week yes yeah which, which was everything from you know lgbq people to people that were just you know out there that were dressed like hippies and there were just everything and the marijuana was in the air like never before <laughs> right exit <laughs> wrong traffic yeah it's like okay all right so we just sat there we just sort of watched Got the world it. go by and then, Julie, then, then it was peaceful yeah, but we are in the parade. We had no choice to be in the parade because when we got off, the cars were ahead of us and behind us were all in the parade. So we just stayed in the parade and we drove around and Julie's Range Rover, you know, as part of this parade for a little bit. And uh, so Julie Googled it and we uh, she texted the nurse who was waiting for us at the doctor's office. And, and she said, oh, yeah, that's that this is part of Spirit Spirit Week. You yeah. know, it goes on all week. And this is this is what the you know the cause is, and this is what they're celebrating, or you know whatever is quite you know it's lovely, quite nice people. Yeah, there was some parade. Nice day for it. There was some floats. I saw some you know people really went to town on decorating their cars. Yeah, I saw some some uh, some dogs that were dyed you know different colors, purple. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I saw a purple poodle. It was all fun. You never you know. know what you're going to see when you go downtown. That's right. Oh, by the yeah, way, we should have we should have warned all of you who don't normally listen to our podcast that our Sunday podcast is intentionally unstructured and irreverent, and we're not really focused necessarily on real estate stuff. This is where Julie and I sort of defrag in preparation for the following week. Or I'm sorry, <laughs> listen to me. I need to defrag in preparation for the, the coming week, yeah. and we're defragging out of the little bits and pieces from the previous week. Um, so we could talk a little bit about real estate. Anything where you... You know, actually, before you do, Julie, uh, you're reading a book. Tell them about the book you're reading. Well, I've got two two going. One, well, I want to talk a little bit about the astronaut thing that I've been watching. Um, we talk now and then about the importance of getting out of your own little mental wheelhouse. You know, for most of you, that's real estate, mortgages, things like that. And just to freshen things up and give you some new thoughts. And so as I was recovering and not really able to talk without coughing or wheezing, things that you guys don't want to listen to, um, I found... There's a, a series, I like you guys have seen this uh, advertised on Facebook and in your email and commercials or whatever called Masterclass. And these are experts in their field that do like little mini seminars on their topic. You know, nothing massively complicated, but if you have a little curiosity, you go and check it out. So I did one from uh, Chris Hadfield, who also wrote a book. He's a Canadian astronaut who's been on lots and lots of different space missions He's also an ex-fighter pilot and a test pilot. You know, he's got the credentials. But he, he wrote a book called The Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth, which I think actually does apply to pretty much everybody listening. Just little micro coaching tips, right? So one of the things that he talks about is that lots of things in life seem and maybe are super complicated, like, you know, flying a space shuttle in his case. And I, and I always think, well, let's keep it in perspective. A listing appointment. Maybe we shouldn't be so wigged out about that. But so he he's, takes each little thing and he studies it, but his flight manual is literally everything that could happen, he has a one-pager for. So he has like an at-a-glance, here's what I'm going to do. And I was reminded of uh, part of the, uh, it's in Harris Rules and it's in the Real Estate Treasure Map, and it's called the uh, Agent's Pre-Listing Prayer. And it talks about, 
you know, like an affirmation and this is how it's going to go and these are the steps and this is what I'm going to do. Do you remember the actual prayer? I'm not off the top of my head in spite of my allergy <laughs> medicine. You wrote <laughs> but it. But it is in the book. You you wrote it, you don't well, remember it. Well, <laughs> it is based on actually, to bring it back to some of your military things that you've read, the, um, you know, when the soldiers are putting together their rifles and they say, this is my gun, it protects me, it's, you know, part of me, it's an extension of me. And that's like their pre-battle thing. It's a Marine thing, but yeah. I think it's a Marine thing, yes. But anyway, so the, there were lots of lessons in the whole astronaut thing. So if they want to check it out, um, it's Chris Hadfield on Masterclass. And I think it's like 25 bucks or something. It's pretty cheap. So that was interesting. And he was talking about how ultimate preparation gives you confidence. And I always am amazed, you know, we're watching the SpaceX thing, how calm and collected these astronauts are. And I think about how people in society, if you just watch it, how people drive, for example, people are freaking out about everything all the time. You say they're nerfed up or they're whatever. You know, astronauts flying stuff in space, calm as can be. And why is it? What's the difference? Because they've studied it. They're prepared. They've gone over it. So, you know, uh, what's the saying? Ignorance equals fear. Knowledge equals confidence. Well, you know, that applies to real estate, too. You're, you're throwing down the, the Harris rules pretty efficiently. You know. the, the meds aren't that strong on your conscience. Yeah, well, they're going to wear off soon, so you've been warned. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, but you know, when the, you listen to three, different things. Your, your tra- probably, this, yeah. this all, all these thoughts are yeah. basically from the idea of you should stay in your own three foot world. That's where yeah. you're, yes. yeah, you're vibing off that. But, but to know that three foot world really well. Yeah. And that's really the bottom line. And that's the reason we want all of you guys to, you know, act small, but think big. And that was the second part of kind of like what I've noticed this sort of recurring theme of, uh, you know, people's behaviors in this past two weeks, honestly, just from what I'm seeing and just what I'm hearing mostly, I don't really, you know, it's what you guys text me and email. I don't go searching for things to worry about, but I'll tell you what, some of you guys really, really don't know how and your mindset, your health, really, the amount of stress you're welcoming into your, your whole lives just because you're consuming all this absolutely garbage bullshit information, you should just stop. You'll feel so much better. <laughs> I felt better taking break from it. Yeah. I felt better, you know, albeit a forced break, you know, being able to choose what I was listening to and watching and having lots of different interests, you know? Yeah, definitely. I you mean, can nerd out. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay now and then. <laughs> I'm warning my coaching clients now. You never know what will come out of next week's coaching class. That's right. Those of you guys who (laughs) heard don't uh, don't know that Julie is a certified nerd. Yes, she took classes. Every day. She's a fifth degree nerd. Yes. Black belt. (laughs) She's a black belt nerd. She, okay, here's the the joke that I always enjoy trying to make her, uh, embarrass her about. But Mm -hmm. the truth is she can't be embarrassed because she's on drugs today. That's true. But Julie is, uh, did play in band. Yes. Her name is Julie, and guess what instrument she played? Yes, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. It's it's a flute, and I actually do remember Julie telling me stories when we met in high school, and where she would start out with one time in band camp. Just one time in band camp. <laughs> Not very many people will understand that, but that's okay. Yeah, they will. <laughs> they're, they're googling it now. American Pie. Yeah, just Google one time in band camp in flute. Yes. <laughs> The nerdum <laughs> continues just in other manifestations. But you know what? I just got by you, right? Yes, I know. It's yeah. Okay. What did the character Julie in American Pie do with her flute? We're, we're not talking about We that. can't talk about that? No, okay. All right. Conversation's peaking. <laughs> well, moving on. So uh, as far as real estate stuff, guys, there's a lot that's going... You're going to start hearing a lot of news that's going to start bubbling up uh, essentially about all these different programs that are essentially running their course. And what we're seeing is um, a lot of our old comrades, old friends from the REO BPO short sale days Mm -hmm. are all sort of, you know, wanting to be on our podcast again. They're wanting to reconnect with us. They're wanting to reconnect with all of you guys. There's no doubt that that market's coming back. And the other thing I'm seeing is I actually got invited and I didn't sign. Well, I had to sign an NDA, but I didn't sign it. So I can tell you guys a little bit about it. We are asked to invest in a, uh, essentially, long story short, Fannie and Freddie are looking to sell off a bunch of zombie loans, or you know, essentially borrowers' loans that they've been walking along the you know the graveyard for long periods of time, where the people are in and out of forbearance and not making their payments. And these are all carryovers from the Great Recession, right? And um, yeah, there's going to be a big pool of those uh, properties that are at least the you know the, the 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 titles, the deeds, the assets themselves, the loans. Those are 
right now looking for homes with private investors. And where, where those are going to end up most likely are private investors, which are going to then be required to do orderly, um, essentially foreclosures on all those houses. They're not going to be allowed to just dump them on the market and they won't do it for their own financial best interest. Why am I telling you all this? Because the train is actually starting to load. And I told you guys when we figured that it was going to give you plenty of notice, that is starting to happen. And we do think and I cannot find any reason not to believe this is true, by this time next year, the conversation is going to definitely uh, be dominated by distressed property. It's going to be dominated by short sales. It's going to be dominated by REOs. It's going to be dominated by all kinds of different things where all these properties are going to go from the weak hands to the strong hands. They're going to go from the people that can't afford them to the people that basically are looking for investments. The only reason, and I think this is very interesting, um, and I've been trying to understand this. So some of you guys, I'm sure are smarter than this stuff than I am. So maybe you can text me and school me on this. But the only reason why there might not be another depreciation trend, which is what I'm uh, talking about, is if there is a lot of inflation and that inflation happens before, and this is the this is the hard part, right? It has to happen before all the forbearances and all the other things that in the economy start to basically adversely affect people's ability to make payments. Uh, now, if the inflation kicks in, which it, nobody, everyone's pretty much agreeing that there's going to be inflation and it's going to be noticeable and it's going to happen sometime in the next five years or less. So if the inflation were to happen sometime in the next, say, 18 months or less, then you might actually not see a great deal of depreciation in real estate and other assets because what happens when there's inflation, real estate and other assets, you know, essentially, they'll go up in cost or value, however you want to explain it. So real estate will get actually, depending on what the inflation rate is, could get substantially more expensive. Now, that's if the inflation were to creep back in within, you know, less, less than 18 months. But what is most likely to happen is that there's going to be inflation, but it's not going to happen for like another three to five years. And by that time, we'll probably be at the uh, tail end of whatever the, um, essentially the deflation, the deflationary cycle that's going to most likely happen in real estate. So this past week, I was talking about and I'll continue to talk about this, and hopefully Julia will join me tomorrow. But we were obviously talking about the fact that we had a moral obligation to be rich. And again, the feedback I had on those series of podcasts was great because, frankly, it's one of my favorite topics. Uh, because the topic cuts through so much of the malarkey that keeps so many of us essentially, you know, essentially poor, basically, or always beholden to another, you know, commission check or never. We, so many of us want to have the formula for being rich where your money works for you. You no longer work for your money. And so you read books and you listen to gurus and sometimes you get suckered into thinking, well, the only way forward is multifamilies. And then you buy a bunch of rental properties and you realize that that sure as hell isn't a silver bullet. And then, you you know, what sucks away all your positive cash flow on the rental properties aside from all the normal things of, you know, falling trees and leaking faucets. Well, you also then have the problem of the property taxes that are going up and you're seeing different cities and states which are now becoming more restrictive and how you can use your property. Many parts of the country right now, they just basically pass essentially laws, whether they're legal or not, who knows, where you can't short-term rental your property. I know. I just can't even believe that. It is. It's, it's, it's I, mean, a, I feel it's like saying, okay, deal as long as you pay the property taxes for those 90 days. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, it's, it's insane. How is that fair? They're you know, telling you what you can do with your own privately owned private property. But well when we, we used well back when, you know, people would travel, right? <laughs> back in the old days, ninety days ago, yeah. that um, we would go to Big Sur every year, California mm-hmm. for uh, for a car week in August. Mm-hmm. And it was if you guys, have, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, 15 or 16,000 of you that will listen to this, there's probably like two of you that know what I'm talking <laughs> about. But for those two, you guys know what I'm talking about. It is magnificent. And um, we would always VRBO out there. Well, Julie got to know some of the, the owners out there that we'd VRBO from on a regular basis. And also we have coaching clients out there. Yep. We're and they, Peninsula. And yeah. they're, right. And they're making you, they pass all kinds of really dumbass, impossible to enforce laws. Like you had to register your VRBO. You have to pay a special tax. Every time you rent your VRBO out, you have to pay a tax, a one-time tax every time you rent your, what the hell? So the city and the, uh, the, that's insanity. And then I guess. Well, so it's also created an underground of workarounds for of that course. stuff too, because people aren't down with that. That's, you know, and, and, you know, the unintended consequences that I see, not just in that market, but places like some of the Florida markets where you've got maybe a, a street full of 10 different condo buildings, right? And three of them have said no short-term rentals. Well, which ones do you think are going to sell better, right? 
and and the the workaround that that owners will do where they'll they'll set it up a certain way on the website and then you know contact you privately and say well yeah you can have a week i mean the, the whole thing is just demented well the point is is that when we were growing up I, man i'm tired of saying that right because we're not that old <laughs> but when we were back growing in our day. Up, back in our day <laughs> right um yeah you had the real estate was essentially the vehicle to uh not only it's really the american dream right to own your own home because owning your own home and having the house hypothetically increase in value is pretty much the only way most people ever sort of um, you know, amass any kind of net worth. And that's the way it's historically been. Now, is it true anymore? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? It depends where you are in the cycle, right? Yep. Depends on whether you held or whether you sold or whatever, whatever. Um, and that's if you're looking at strictly from the investment perspective. Now, really, at the end of the day, a house is to live in and a property is someplace where you have to have a place to live and, you know, all those types of things. So you're moving away from in a market like this, people will still transact. They're going to move away from financial motivation and they're going to move towards, you know, more intrinsic motivation. So those are the types of things we can look forward to. But why am I telling you guys all this? Because in a world where everything is changing and everything's going to keep changing, your software, my software is telling us to acquire more rental properties, right? More rental properties, buy more rental properties, pay them off, have the cash flow. But I'm not really sure that that even makes any sense anymore. And you then you could say, well, you know, buy multifamilies, buy big, huge multifamilies. Well, the, the math still in the investment potential there still is dubious. Now you can look at, there's some great REITs out there, you know, real estate investment trusts, and you can look to see what they hold. And if you can get enough scale because you're investing with a REIT and, you know, they own 15 billion doors. And they're managing it for you and yeah. you don't have a lot of, you know, phone calls in the world of night and that right. sort of thing. But then sure. it starts to make sense. <laughs> so yeah, be careful that you don't slip. It, it, whatever cycle we're going into, whether it's going to be depreciation and then there's going to be inflation or whether we're, we're going to go right to inflation, nobody really knows. I told you my theory. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever cycle we're headed into next, don't just enter back into you know the same cycle. If you're thinking, well, I, it's time for me to buy real estate. Well, maybe. 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 That's the answer. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Be well, careful. I mean, I think about people that do the um, instant offers that they've created on their own when we wrote the white paper about how to deal with, you know, being your own investor. Yeah. If you can find something that's under market and the seller is just so motivated that you can get a deal on it and it doesn't hurt you if you have to hold it for a while, you can turn it into a rental. You don't have a bunch of, you know, maintenance. Yeah, but fees. maybe. But, but that's so maybe. Yeah. Right? That's like that's like hen's teeth to right. find something, especially in this market, that's that good. That usually comes from a listing appointment you go on where you luck out or a past client or a relative, you know, something like that. But to think that that's going to be the home run, I'm not so sure anymore. Mm -mm, neither am I. Um, and we're going to be talking more about that on the podcast this week. And we're going to deep dive. We have three more points about how you have a moral obligation to be rich. All I'm asking you guys to do is don't just think that the what you think about wealth accumulation is accurate because it, it really isn't anymore. Everything is changing. How you go about thinking about the actual US dollar in an inflationary time when they're you know printing I think it's 14 or 12 trillion dollars and they're going to continue to print all this money yeah. there could be a whole bunch of drama that's going to happen around the currency currency devaluation all this other stuff who knows right I mean we're in historic times and we're going to stay in historic times for a long period of time where people are going to go back and study this as being you know some sort of transformative in a good or a bad way sure. for our country so keep your minds open because it's in times like this where pretty much everything starts to change. I was reading, um, actually when I was waiting for you when you were in the doctor, I was uh, reading a really good article, Scott Holloway. I can't remember, I can't believe I remembered his name. He's a, prof he's a marketing professor at the University of New York, I think, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I've watched his videos on YouTube before. He's really brilliant. He talks about brands. He, that's basically his wheelhouse. He talks about brands and marketing. Mm -hmm. He talks mostly his focus is on luxury brands and, you know, just interesting stuff, I think. Mm -hmm. But one of the things he was interviewed for, I think it was a PBS person that was interviewing him. They were talking about higher education. Mm -hmm. And he said a, a whole bunch of things I'd never really thought about, but it's so obviously true. He said essentially what every university and college in the United States has done is they've all tried to make themselves a Rolex level brand. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. So they all tried to make themselves look and feel the same, you know, and they rose their, increased their prices. And he gave an example of like, 
I forget over what period of time. I, I wish I would have written it down. But it wasn't very long, 10 or 15 years. The cost of uh, college in the United States has increased by 1,600%. Yeah, I've read that too. Yeah. And, insane. Yeah, right. And then he goes, then he says, has the value that students are obtaining increased anywhere near 1,600%? No way. Hell no. I remember, you know, back in our day, um, when we went to Ohio <laughs> State, I remember it cost $777 per quarter. Mm-hmm. And that was expensive then. You know, we, we were both working two or three jobs and, you know, eventually got our real estate license and yada, yada. But 777 bucks a quarter. I bet you, you'd be hard pressed to find any school that's not an online school where you could get away with that. Well, beyond, and, and are we are our kids getting 1,600% more education? But be honest. No way. When we went to Ohio State... Mm-hmm. And it was essentially, you know, twenty hundred, three thousand, thirty two hundred dollars a year, whatever it yeah. cost, because we drove there. Right. Uh, and we didn't live on campus. And right. We, you know, it could have been worse. But we were still overpaying, honestly. Probably. Yeah. Your your music education, not so much, because you were actually going to a real school. Yeah. But the classes we took there and the manner sure. in which they ran it was absolute garbage. I mean, if I now to keep it even, Stephen, back then you didn't have an option like Khan Academy yeah. or like. Out school or any, you know, there's hundreds of different options that, that exist now. Um, but, you know, yeah, I think in comparison, it's just... But it was garbage. You'd walk into a room and there'd be, you know, three or four hundred people there. The professor never showed up. You were four... If you even had a professor. You were, yeah, it was a TA who right. was maybe five years older than you. It, there was yeah. a... You had to buy the, the professor's books at one bookstore and like one little shitty book would cost like $300. It's a total scam. Totally. But the point is the students college, it's always been basically a little honey hole for, you know, those types of people. And it just, it's it, over the, you know, past what, 10 or 15 years, it's mm-hmm. become even more so. Well, I, I do think partially, at least as a result of this whole COVID thing, you're going to see a major transformation. Well, that was his point. <clears throat> so what did he have to say about that? Okay. So his point was the only colleges and universities that are going to stay in place, mm-hmm. stay in business now, are essentially uh, the ones with the largest endowments. That and 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 there's some that have endowments, Julie, of billions of oh, dollars. I'm sure. I'm I mean, sure. there's colleges and universities that are sure. sitting on. He he cited one that had four freaking billion dollars, like in an endowment, you know, which is probably with several different hedge funds, and they're making money yeah. off of it. They could sure. never sell another student into their college, and they did do just fine. well off their savings. But and there was Makes there sense. was many like that actually that had sure. enormous amounts of money. Well, I mean, that's what people do is they leave their money right. to the school. Well, yeah. he he essentially what the consensus was is that people now that they have had you know college education via Zoom and you know Verbella University, which EXPI owns, and all these you know Verbella. The so- if you guys don't know what Verbella is, just Google it. V I R B E L L A. As a shareholder of EXPI. Um, which all of you will be or are if you're EXP agents, you actually own Verbella, right? You, the, our EX, EXPI actually owns Verbella as well. So Verbella is, is an online you know, campus and it, it's, you can have your own online campus. Whether And we're going to do it probably for our, our uh, coaching um, program, right? For our university, our own school. We're going to have that through Verbella and people are going to be able to show up to virtual, um, you know, camp, uh, the virtual campus and go to the virtual classrooms and the whole thing. We're going to take full advantage of all the amazing technologies that's offered through Verbella. But the point is, the point I'm trying to make is that all of these students, all of these parents, all of this everything has now been like forced to take a real hard look at why the hell does college cost this much money? And it's, it is fascinating, like, and it still happens to this day, an online degree or an online this or the other thing for the old, you know, essentially the, uh, the system basically wants to treat anything that's online as less than, right? So you, you, could, you could be watching a Zoom meeting with the most knowledgeable you know, physicist in the world yeah. telling you about whatever the hell he's telling you about, and you're just sitting there just as if you were in the classroom. I, I actually enjoy it more because, and, and there's been studies done about this, and there are a lot of different colleges and schools that are making these changes. The way that, that most of us listening, or you or I, came up was you learned, you, you were in the lecture, and then you had to do your homework, Right. I like the online stuff better because you can rewind that and learn it better, right? And when you're live with a teacher, you either learn it or you don't. And I think that's one of the reasons I didn't really like math is because once you miss two or three chapters, you're basically up a creek, right? So I think that there's a lot of intrinsic value of the new way of being taught as well. And I think that some of the modifications, many of the modifications, because I'm watching what Zoe School is doing, 
that are required now by the government for COVID requirements may diminish the experience to the point which it's, it's certainly not worth the money, but it's not worth going there live. Maybe not for everybody. Well, then I have a question for you. But I think that that's going to be an impact. So, Julie, you, you guys, many of you do or don't. If you have kids, you know what a 529 is, right? So you can basically, um, long story short, you can prepay for your kid's college yeah. education. We did that when Zoe was born. So we've prepaid for her college education. We don't have to save any more money for it. Um, but I wonder if that was even smart. I mean, here's... I remember the one we got is transferable to use for other purposes. Yeah, but still, but I mean, still, if we, you know, we put in, one. we put in 45 grand when she was one. Mm -hmm. So if you just invested that same 45 grand into, you know, the S and P 500 freaking index funds, what? It's supposed to make 8%, but we'll see. It's supposed to make 8%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, but that's, but they, you know, they're all, my, my point is, is if we were to take that same 45 grand sure. and invested over the same 18 years, basically. Yeah. And I wonder how much more money that could have hypothetically been if you just, you know, done conservative vesting sure. through index funds through like a oh, Vanguard, know. you know, S&P or Dow. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Some sort of absolutely lock I know. solid. I think, I think people are going to be much more diversified. And I think part of the proof to that is people right but now. But why did we do it? Why did we do it? Because For fear of the cost going up. Absolutely. Because it will go up. But, why, but, you know, but, but this the whole premise of 529s could be completely invalidated now. That's true. We'll yeah. see what happens. Well, okay, let's say hypothetically, mm -hmm. you know, we decide to keep the money in that account. Yeah. And, you know, it's going she then can go to basically a top tier school anywhere, you know, assuming she can get in academically. Better. You know, right, she better. <laughs> uh, or she's just going to basically be stuck managing a lot of rental properties rest for life that unfortunately because we probably can't ever sell those because we'd have to pay the taxes on the gains. Exactly. <laughs> so those are going to be Zoe's inheritance. But the moral of the story is is like if I had little kids right now, and I were seeing what happens is happening with colleges and universities and whatnot. You know what I would do? I wouldn't do a five twenty nine. Honestly, mm -hmm. I would take that same amount of money um, and I would in, I would put that into a retirement account. You know, sure. for myself and my wife, or my husband and myself, or whatever. I would definitely not. Um, yeah, well, there's nothing saying you can't then turn it around, and use it for education, just because it's not called a five twenty nine. You well, it, make a better choice. But it's clear now, if societally, a Harvard and Yale, yeah. and all these other, you know, top tier schools, and that's what sure. Scott Galloway said. They're the only ones that are going to survive. Yeah. He he actually had a prediction. Now I'm going to get into the weeds here because I don't remember the number, but I think he said something like. Four to six thousand colleges and universities will fail because wow. they can't attract students like they need to to support cash flow, and they also can't attract the same level of donations. Uh, you know, basically to support the the infrastructure, which is usually typically it. how these well, endowments I work. I mean, think about that too. How many people are going to continue to donate to entities like that? And I'll tell you what: another unintended consequence. Some of our most common new coaching clients are, guess who? Teachers. Oh, I've seen that. Administrators. Yep. Um, people from law enforcement. Right. So, you know, I've even one of our very good friends, Erica from um, Georgetown. You yeah. Know, who is who great teacher. Loved teaching. Loved it. Getting a real estate license. Yeah, I would too. You know, because she's not signing up for that again. Yeah, you know? I mean, one of our so, what the member. I just um, think it's interesting. You don't remember their names? He was a uh, cop. What was his first name? Mike. And what was mm -hmm. his wife's name? Rachel. Rachel, right. So we knew them from Orange Theory. She was a nurse and he was a cop. And by the way, you never in a million years would have guessed this guy is a cop because he was so freaking friendly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> when he told me he was a cop, I thought he was lying, honestly, um, because yeah. he's just he, he's not what I ex expected as a cop. But he is. And we've been following him on Facebook and he's been talking about um, some of the things that he's dealing with back in Austin, mm -hmm. as far as the protests and all these other things. And I'm reading, and he got, he has, you know, he and his wife have COVID, right? Yes, I saw that. Yeah. And he, he probably is the one that infected his family. I would imagine. Yeah. And he's in the thick of it. Right, exactly. That's yeah, what he she's said. She's a nurse too, but it probably mm -hmm. was him. Yeah. And so I was just reading that and thinking to myself, you know, I don't think considering all the different things that are going on with being a law enforcement officer, even a, probably a fantastic cop like he is. Absolutely. The right guy in the right job at the right time. I don't think I'd want to do that job. No way. But yeah, no way. Honestly. I mean, my heart goes out to people that we need, we need people to be great at those jobs and nursing and teaching. And, you know, that that's... When I have a, a fear pop up of what's where all this is headed, it's that because it's the great people out there that should be doing those jobs that are maybe having second thoughts about that. Yeah, well, you they know? should. And I, that makes me sad that, you know, that's 
an unintended consequence. And so we'll see what history proves going forward, how all this shakes out. Yeah, I know. It's amazing, so, isn't it? You know, but uh, our prayers but, but, go out to them and their family. I'm sure they, they'll have a speedy recovery, but we're yeah, thinking of them. They are. I've been, I've, I told okay. him, I told him he's donut infused. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's my cop joke. <laughs> no, they're in really good shape. They'll be fine. Yeah. I um, mean, they were running marathons like a month ago. So. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Remember we were supposed to run that 10K with them and then you backed out the last minute? Oh, hold on. Oh, was, wait a minute. Wasn't was that, that you? I think that was me. Yeah. it was too early in the morning. <laughs> That's a true story. Poor thing. Yeah. Remember how pissed Rachel was when I she did that? She was pissed. You're yeah, still paying was. for that. I know. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so as far as the colleges and universities, that's just an example. Julie and I bring up these points to try to, or these examples to try to help all of us. We do it to our, for ourselves, right? Just like when you start talking about something like the colleges and universities and you, you Julie and I are from a you know, Ohio State University, we are always looming in the shadow of the horseshoe, you know, that's where we grew up and everything was OSU. You guys drive through Still Texas, is. you guys drive through Texas, you see Texas flags, you see the occasional American flag. Occasionally you see people flying both flags. When you drive through Columbus, Ohio, all you see is OSU flags. That's it. You would think you lived in the country of called OSU. And nobody has blue or gold in their closet. You're not allowed to. Nope. Yeah. It doesn't exist. Michigan colors, for those of you guys <laughs> who don't know. Um, yeah. So when you start thinking in terms of, well, that's how it's always been. That's how it'll sure. always be. Not necessarily. No, it won't. Yeah. And and then, you know, so if that is really an unraveling of some sort of institutional, you know, sort of outdated because technology is replacing it. But more than that, technology doesn't ever actually change anything. It's people's accept, accepting an, an adaptation to the technology that changes things. It's it's the reason like sometimes, you know, just kind of bouncing all over the place. But okay. sometimes you guys are all fearful about real estate agents being, um, they can hear that, you know, Sorry. about real estate agents being somehow magically, they can hear that how real estate agents are somehow magically uh, going to be replaced by technology. It's never really going to happen. And, you know, sometimes I'm on other people's podcasts that are technologists, but they're not real estate people. And they sort of are testing the waters to see what my opinion on all of it is. And, you know, why is, why are realtors still in the business? Why are, you know, commission structures? And not, but that conversation has been going on for 25 years. Well, but here's the reason why. Yeah. It's because people are willing to pay for it, right? Yes. That's why. It's because consumers want to pay for that service. It's not just because, like the technologists, because they're so freaking up their own asses and their egos, right? Yeah. They think that technology somehow is the new religion that's going to replace and evolve everything. And we're all going to be beholden to those who are technologists who have the power, right? You guys really realize that that's the big picture it's an ego play but why haven't why are agents relevant and always will be relevant <laughs> because the fact that people want to use a professional when it comes to making a very stressful decision there'll never be a time in history look it'll be essentially agents who are you know i'd say um you know built around technology platforms the ones that will rule ruin rule the day but the idea that there's going to be some big technology company that's going to make agents all sorts of you know hourly uh you know essentially workers where they're just going to basically follow checklists and there's going to be a That'll dispassionate risk it'll never happen if you think about other businesses where they still require salespeople, and I've really been thinking about this to, because, again, I've had a lot that question quite often. And the reason the technologists are frothing right now is because they perceive that there's going to be a big disruptive opportunity coming to the real estate headlines in the near future um, where they can then basically gobble up market share because so many people in the industry are going to be so displaced. That's what happened last time. Guess when Zillow started during the Great Recession? Guess when all these other companies, these technologists who thought they were going to make us obsolete and remove us from the middle, guess when they started during the Great Recession? So all these technology companies, they're all frothing because they think they're going to be able to do it again and gobble up more market share. And I just, I cannot, look, I can um, intellectually conceive uh, and understand why they think what they think, but I know, and you know, Consumer behavior, people's behavior. They will never want to just go online and fill out a form and then unless it's some sort of you know, disinterested investor and basically go through that process. And here's the example. And this was kind of fascinating when I had this little, you know, <laughs> epiphany. So you can buy an Apple product online, right? I mean, I bought, Julie and I, now that we live in Puerto Rico, there's no Apple store here. So we buy everything, um, you know, online when we buy, when we go through the upgrade cycle about every year and a half. And we're probably going to do it later this year when the iPhone, what is it, 12 comes out or whatever. Mm -hmm. By the way, that thing looks like a surfboard. It's so big. I know. 
<laughs> I don't know who's. Might not have to wear my glasses. Anymore. I don't know whose pocket they think that thing's going to fit in. Seriously, <laughs> your damn iPhone's going to start needing a you know a purse just to carry it around. Definitely. But anyway, so but Apple stores still have salespeople. Yes, they do. Okay, so there's a technology company that is absolutely online, and you go into the Apple Store, and you're it, it's run just like a good old fashioned retail business, where there's a greeter at the front, they direct you, mm-hmm. and then they'll get on the little, you know, they they basically copy what Victoria's Secret did. Victoria's Secret, there's, you know, I'm, that business is not doing well right now, but not because the concept isn't good, but because the fact that the nature of what they were selling is no longer the trend. But this, the business is set up so that when you walk in, there's a greeter. They ask you, can I help you? They know you're always going to say no. And then um, they know that you're going to meander further back in the store. And then there's layers of people with differing levels of right. um, sales experience that are there just waiting for you. So they know the further you get into the store, that they know they can ask you if you need any help. Can we open up? You know, Can we start? And a, you could very well do all that online all by yourself. But, but people do you? don't. No, you don't. Right. Why? And those are not necessarily expensive items, right? No. And it's not not complicated like a real estate transaction is. You've seen the amount of paperwork required now. It's bonkers. And it that is was bonkers. Before COVID paperwork. Right. I mean, all I ha- all I have to do to convince myself that I I think of these technology companies. I love you know. There's lots of different versions of them, and there's apps, and there's online different things. I think that they are support to the human element, not replacement too. It's and I I think some of them are your new assistant. You know, you would have been right. a human to do that before. That doesn't mean you're being replaced. It means you're being enhanced. It means you're getting more efficient. And that's something that we should embrace, right? But what I think of is, you really think that people will be able to deal with each other through inspections, appraisals, and title work and contracts? They can barely handle it with two agents involved. Are you kidding me? (laughs) So I just think that that's ridiculous, you know? And we've all, we can all reflect back to, you know, oh my God, the MLS is going online. And, uh, you know, we're all going to be disintermediated and, Oh my God, you mean we're not using thermal fax machines? We can get it in our email now? And what's this texting version? You know, there's always going to be something new coming out, but you've got to look at it as an enhancement tool and an efficiency tool, not as a threat to yourself. That doesn't mean you shouldn't learn it. That doesn't mean you should have your head in the sand, but don't freak out by it. Well, but the unfortunate truth is for a lot of small, essentially teams and individual agents and brokers, the technology that you have to, everything is essentially forcing you to use certain technology suites, right? You got your dot loop and you got your other CRM type prop, you know, management things. You got your everything. All those types of things are becoming expected. And if you don't do them, if you absolutely don't have those as part of your business, you're not going to be able to communicate with other people. You're not going to be able to, you know, send transactions back. <laughs> Julie needs to go take a break. Go ahead and take a break to come back. I'm getting ice. I'm okay. Back. You're fine. Everybody understands. Julie's walking around like a zombie. I should take a picture. No, no picture. <laughs> yeah. So you do need that. You do need a technological backbone that it enables you to stay relevant and communicate with, you know, the rest of the real estate uh, business models, right? You have to have that. You don't have a choice. That's fine. That's great. The cost thing is what's going to kill many of these businesses, brokers in particular. Your agents are going to demand, you guys already know this, what I'm telling you, they're going to demand you have a certain minimum level of you know, technological support for them. And if you don't provide that, which many of you, know, many of you listening are small, medium-sized brokers, you can't really afford to provide all that and do it in such a way that you're still going to make a profit. That's why a lot of the real estate brokerages are essentially going to fold and that's already starting to happen a majority of the calls i take every week are from i would say the average real estate broker i talk with is between 25 and 50 uh agents complete total right and i'll I'll share with you listeners what the numbers always are so you have a brokerage let's say with 50 people and the bro and these brokers are all calling about the same thing they don't ever start out by saying this maybe one or two the really honest ones have their heads screwed on straight will say tim you got to help me figure out how to either basically you know they're asking for a graceful exit out of the business that's really the punchline they're looking for a way to no longer have to run the business but they don't want to feel like they're going down in flames and she's back then she's back and so they want to um they want a graceful exit they want to figure out a way that they can essentially get out from the horrible crushing burden 
of being a broker because being a real estate broker only makes you a broker and they found that out the hard way. Or teams are the same way. Teams, like when you, you see these awards and whatnot coming out acknowledging teams, top teams, guys, come on now. You're a real estate broker. Let's just call it as it is. There's really functionally no difference between a real estate team and a brokerage anymore. I don't. He, I have no clue. It, it's just a trend. The word team is a trend. Just call it what it is. It's a broker. Yeah. So what happened was you guys were all tricked into uh, owning very unprofitable brokerages because you were, for, you were uh, manipulated into starting a, a, a team. Had someone told you and manipulated you that your path forward in your real estate career was to start a brokerage, you probably would very quickly figure that out because there's so much information about how that's such a poor cash, you know, profit producing business, you would have easily stumbled across someone that told you never to start a brokerage. But oh, no, you start a real estate team. And that's the smart move. That's what everybody's doing. This has been a trend for like the past 15 years, listeners. So you start a tra- you start a team and oh, all this magical stuff happens, right? All the, the you all of a sudden have, you know, unicorns running through your backyard and, you know, <laughs> the clouds clear when you start believing all these lies, all these fairy tales. And so the reality of it is, is that teams are nothing other than brokerages. So these calls I get from a vast majority of these brokers and these teams and whatnot, they sometimes know their numbers, usually don't know their numbers, never really want to stay in using their current business model, know that they were just living month to month, essentially paying their bills month to month when the mark was great, had COVID in, in, during quarantine absolutely be the ultimate coming to Jesus uh, event of their lifetimes because boom, sales stopped, cash flow stopped. They realized then essentially the value of their business was nothing. And so now they're all trying to figure out a, a graceful exit. And, and they almost always are a perfect fit for eXp Realty. And that's the conversation that I've been having over and over because they want to join Julie and I's eXp Realty team, which is great. If you want to talk about that, just text me directly at 512 758 0206 and we'll go through your numbers, right? We'll look at your numbers. We'll look at the facts. We'll. I'll ask you the questions you don't want to have asked, and you'll have to give me the answers that maybe you've been avoiding ever having to think about answering those questions. But that is the important thing to do now because you do have a little window before the end of the year. And what we're predicting, and so far I'm not seeing any reasons to believe this is not true, unfortunately, is we're predicting certainly no V-shaped recovery that we're going to be entering into a long, long recession, depression. Who cares what it's called? They're all made up words anyway. But we're going to enter into a, a, a market cycle, which is going to go through a corrective cycle, whether it's inflation or whether it's deflation, it doesn't really matter. The moral of the story is the seller's market is over. And when that happens, so many agents without skills aren't going to make it. And so many brokerages, which were predicated, were, which were built on buyer sides and buying buyer leads for their agents, they're going to be wiped out. And that's all starting to happen. And you guys who are being honest with yourselves are starting to see it happens. So how many other businesses are there out there that have only been getting by with like less than 5% margins? The average broker is 2 or 3% net profit before in taxes month. in a normal month, right? And now they're operating completely in the red. And so many other businesses are like that too. And so like, I feel sorry for all these business owners. I really do. I, you know, I, my dad was always an entrepreneur and never, we always were hand to mouth basically the whole time I was growing up, Julie's parents were school teachers. So why Julie married somebody who had the, you know, jinky background like that, we'll never know. I was thinking. (laughs) (laughs) But, but the truth is, is that I know the suffering of a business owner and it breaks my heart. But, but here's the thing. Many of those people, because they won't lose that entrepreneurial spirit, they will recreate themselves into something else if they allow themselves to. But that truthfully is a minority. What most people do after they suffer a failure is they never try again. They get knocked on their heels and they basically are so in their heads that there's something you know innately wrong with them that they can't ever succeed at anything. And, and here's the thing I, I think this is the reason ultimately people um, call me is because I say this and this is really the truth. There's nothing wrong with any of you. If your business is failing, if your brokerage is failing, if your team is failing, or if you suspect it's going to be failing, here's what I'm here to tell you. There's nothing wrong with you. There's something wrong with the business model that you were trying to replicate. There's something wrong with the people or the advice that you got from maybe good, good-natured good people who were telling you what maybe they thought was the right thing to do but never done it themselves. You guys notice that? How many people out there are telling you what to do with your real estate business in particular but they've never actually been in real estate? How crazy is that? That drives me up the wall. I mean, it, it, but isn't that – I, <laughs> well, I don't get why true. agents don't actually – that it baffles me. There's yeah. no other industry – 
where people would go to advice from people no. uh, uh, that, look, it, going to an accountant and asking about accounting is fine, right? That makes sense. You hire specialists to provide specialist type answers. Sure. But going to somebody who's never sold real estate before and asking them, how do you, you know, what's the secret for my role? It's, that's complete insanity. Um, and so, again, we're seeing the end of a macro, uh, a major cycle in real estate. And we're going to see lots of ends to lots of types of things that have been normalized. What got us on this tangent was talking about the, uh, the big physical, you know, bricks and mortar colleges and universities. There's every reason to believe that those are going to go the way of the dodo bird, which is you know, extinct in case you didn't know that. And the same thing's going to happen with so many other types of businesses that were also dependent on the old way of doing business, not just online, but people's expectations. So this is what's changed. And this is what's not changed with real estate. So now that people were forced into quarantine for the past, however long, and they're forced to have all these conversations, right? And they're going to, the people are not going to want to ever go back to saying, they're going to always say now, why the hell is that so expensive? If I can go Zoom or I can do all these other things, whereas before the system was essentially able to say online is less than. Now they all went online, so they can't say it's less than anymore. So they were basically called out on their own lie, weren't they? Less than, you mean not just expensive-wise, you mean less than experience-wise, quality. Experience -wise, quality, yeah, quality wise. right. Yeah. And, then, and then as such, the existing institutions we're able to say if you have a online degree, that degree is not worth the same as one that's based on yeah, bricks and mortar anymore. education. Not anymore. It's all changed. Yeah. And so if you guys think about all the other things because of COVID, because of the reaction to COVID and the quarantining, all these things that are happening. And by the way, guys, they're just starting to get happen. They're just starting to happen, right? We're going to see the rate of change. And this is kind of where my, my mind was going when I was reading that Scott Galloway uh, article. The rate of change because of COVID, went from essentially things that would have normally taken probably 10 years to like six months. Yeah, for sure. And it's just getting started because now the momentum is moving towards sort of the unknown future and away from all the things that have now been you know, yeah. proven I, I to be. I think people are more in acceptance of it now than in the beginning. Yeah, me too. You know, they are. They're more open to it because they've had experiences. They've had, you know, some people have had hundreds of Zoom calls by now. I know you have, mm -hmm. you know, and now it's, it's become normalized. Just like that in 90 days, that became okay. Yeah, you know, and Google's gotten in, Google's gotten in on the whole Zoom thing. I mean, out in everyone's yeah. Gmail right now, there's a little if you guys look at your Gmail, the look at your mail client on your desktop or your notebook and look in the upper right-hand uh, corner, there's I think it might be on mobile too, I'm not sure, but there's a little icon where you can literally start essentially, you know, Google's version of a Zoom meeting right there off yeah. your phone and invite people that are in your it's bad ass. I experimented with yeah. it. It's so it's wonderful. Um, you know, we talked Very a couple cool. weekends ago about what's going to happen when there's this big satellite net everywhere that Elon Musk is secretly putting into the, you know, lower atmosphere. We talked about essentially what, you know, the interim technology of 5G and how these things are. So, guys, look, we're going to always challenge you to try to think, you know, big because these types of thoughts make it so that mentally and emotionally you start to feel a little bit more excited, don't you? I do. And I have these conversations with some of you guys, and I, and I, it, sometimes you guys just listen and you don't say anything, and then maybe the next day or the day after that, I'll get a text or an email, and then someone will say, you know, I was thinking about that, and here's what I, I've come up with. And some of the, you guys have so many great um, entrepreneurial ideas and thoughts that uh, you've never allowed them to express because you're so stuck in the mud with trying to have things return back to this normal that'll never return to. Yeah. And so that's kind of the, I, I guess that's the theme of where all my calls, that's my defrag, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, for my, all my calls this week. We, we can memorialize the past market until the cows come home. We can, we can mourn it. We can cry for it. We can wish it was. We can talk about the good old days when people used to, you know, <gasps> shake hands. <laughs> Right. Right. We we could talk about the good old days. But you know when, what it reminds when, me of when people didn't wear masks maybe, everywhere. Maybe this is too far of a stretch, but you know, out of the dark ages, which maybe looking back, at least the first half of 2020 might be construed as the great pause. You know, came the enlightenment, and maybe there's going to be a 5G enlightenment. Maybe there's going to be a technological enlightenment, a great shift that comes from all of this. 
And the thing is, getting from here to there is what is always hardest. The transitioning market is harder than the transitioned market. Think about what you just said. Do you remember, um, I sort of do, hopefully, generally speaking, you'll remember these details better than I. You see I'm setting you up. Okay, <laughs> no so the, the Enlightenment essentially uh, coincided, followed almost the, um, the plague mm-hmm. and that whole era, sure. European Dark history, ages, yeah. the Dark Ages. So how long did the great, so how long were the Dark Ages and how long did, the, did it take for the, uh, the, you know, the Enlightenment actually kick in and how long historically was the Enlightenment um, you know, how long of a, a time in history was, it was that? A lot was longer, it I think. Five years, I'd, ten years? I'd it have, was. I'd have to right. look it up, but yes. And, and we heard some, it yeah. was. But but to your but point. The, there was a catalyst, though, okay? And we pulled out of it, and things got better. So that's that's what I'm thinking But here's, here's the myth of, the, of that era, and here's the other myth of the Great Depression, too. Mm-hmm. And Julie and I didn't know this until we were listening to somebody else's podcast. There were more patents issued during the Great Depression, yeah. a, a density of patents that were created because of the Great Depression, because people were stuff like they are now. Stuff was going on. Right, stuff you know, was going it was, on. It wasn't just like a screeching halt. A lot of the infrastructure that now we're going to end up rebuilding <laughs> started originally there and then has been rebuilt a few times. But, you know, the railroads and the uh, lots of technology happened during then, the patents it's pretty amazing. Well, so, but, so don't think that nothing's going on, and that maybe that's why we reflect on what Elon Musk has been up to and SpaceX. Because you know, if you only paid attention to the news, it'd be wall to wall COVID and protests. But in fact, in the background, we have this really cool thing that's going up in the sky. See, that's the thing, though, right there. Mm-hmm. You said it. Um, so sorry if you guys hear breezes and whatnot. Julie and I, as you know, do this podcast outside on Sunday. Um, so the as far as the the enlightenment, okay. The Enlightenment probably was overlapping with the Dark Ages. Yes, they were probably sure. going on simultaneously. I yeah. think the Enlightenment was started in uh, Florence. I mean, there, wasn't there was no declaration of, okay, today that's we start saying. the Enlightenment. Exactly. Just like now. Right, just like yeah. now. And so this is happening right now around us, all around us. Are you paying attention or are you just watching CNN and Fox well, News? Are you participating? Right. Mentally pr- participate at the very least, because then you can be part of the new conversation and you can sort of feel comfortable letting go of, of hoping and praying that the old normal returns, which it never will. Um, but here's really where I was going with this thought. The, let's say, for example, the Dark Ages lasted for however long they lasted. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. evidently, neither one of us are remembering that. And then, you know, there was an overlapping and then people remember historically as being the age of enlightenment. Now that we have the Internet, now that we have Zoom, now that we have the ability to instantly communicate anywhere on the planet, all of those time frames. Let's say, let's say, right. Let's say the whole thing between the dark ages and the enlightenment, let's say it was 30 years. (laughs) Yeah. So you had to go through all this sort of dark age bullshit and all these people were, you know, horrible hardship all over Europe, mostly, you know, it's just before United States or before America was, you know infested with Europeans, right? Right. Okay, so you had that era, and and then you had another probably longer period that was the Enlightenment, which people remember, you know, it's the Renaissance, art, and, you know, music, and all these things that are culturally still direct. So many things are based on the thinking, the technology that came from that era uh, in European history to this day that you just take for granted. Like, just everything you can possibly imagine from technology and um you know leonardo da vinci had done so many sketches in his art books of things that were sort of modeled for you know future plans for even the modern technology we're using today and all that came out of that era it's kind of flipping amazing but nowadays again you have all of what would have taken back in the you know that era that time in history a billion years ago without being interconnected like we all are now we can essentially get to that point of massive evolution through our, our own modern enlightenment so much faster than we ever were to before. And that's what it feels like to me. Yeah, well, I hope we get through the Dark Ages faster, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. but... The, but it's possible because... They'll, of, they'll uh, live together. Yeah. They'll have to. They that's are. right. Coexist. Right. They, like you said, there can't just be, oh, it's now Enlightenment Day. Right. Maybe you know, we like, should sp- declare that. We have a lot of listeners. <laughs> Right? I mean, we could. Wouldn't that be awesome? Maybe we are starting a movement. I don't know. That'd yeah. be okay with me. If we're starting a movement, we need to come up with a logo. We do. What would our logo be if it was a movement? Something happy. 
<laughs> yeah, for God's the sake, sun. right? The I sun. don't know. Something, something that, good. Something that can't be co-opted or misconstrued, right? Exactly. Something right? that doesn't have any sort of historical com- uh, context that it we weren't... It can be pro- questioned in a million different ways right. and criticized. Yeah, exactly. A hundred years from now, deemed to be evil. Like, even shapes nowadays, really. I mean, a triangle, right, or a circle. Those things, someone could, you know, lace those back to having some sort of historical, you know, connotation that was somehow for this or anti that. I know. But it is good to have some perspective. And, you know, one of the uh, the other books that I'm reading about, I've mentioned it before, Lady in Waiting, you know, she she went all over the world in, basically in service of Queen Elizabeth, but in her own right was an aristocrat. And, you know, she and her husband settled a Caribbean island, Mystique, you know, and to, to keep things in perspective. And that was like in the 50s. That was 1950s. That wasn't even that long ago. But it's called that because that's, I think it's Creole for mosquito. <laughs> you know, it's just like there's a reason for that. So even though she had a life back in England doing all these crazy things for the coronation, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile... She'd go to the Caribbean and catch lobsters with her hands, and they didn't have any air conditioning, and she had like this dual life, right? So I think it's just good to keep things in perspective and say, you know what, there's a lot of great things that are going on, there's a lot of crap that you gotta deal with, control your three-foot world, keep it together. For the sake of humanity, you do have an obligation to be rich, to make yourself rich, to make your, when I was um, on all of my many allergy medications, listening to one of your podcasts about you have an obligation to be rich, I was making a mental list, like, what can you do when you do create that income? Dude, you're stepping on my shows this week. What, I'm just giving you a precursor because we need to wrap. And what, <laughs> what's the list that you, that you can't do, that you're always saying, oh, I can't afford that, I can't afford that? You know, it, there's just not even any comparison. I don't know why anybody even, you know, is too lazy to do anything about Julie it. just foreshadowed the Tuesday show coming up this week. But the, wait, there's more. But wait, there's wait more. Wait until Tuesday. <laughs> or tomorrow. Monday well, but no, it's true, right? Yeah. You know, it's so just interesting. the greatest fortunes, and this is this is so fascinating. And I remember when you and I first read this, or I don't know what we were listening to, but this is way back in our very formidable years when we were early twenties. We came across like lots of historical examples of um, you know how the greatest fortunes in the history of humanity have always been made during the greatest times of change. Mm-hmm. So don't talk because you're muffling your mic. And so it's fascinating that that's happening right now, and people don't know it. Really, it is. That's true. Yeah. I they're, think that's they're, right. And it, you know what? Back in those times, too, the Industrial Revolution, the Technological Revolution, there were so many external uh, things to worry about and distractions. And, you know, the news was trying to point you in this direction and that direction. All the while, you were feeling yourself spread th- so thin and you, you know, were, didn't know where to focus. You never really moved the needle for yourself financially. You know, all these things happen because you're not in control of basically where you put your efforts every single day. And many of you have normalized that sort of erratic, you know, neurotic behavior of overthinking everything. And I mean that in the most literal of senses. And, right. and then you surround yourself with more things that are going to reinforce the overthinking. And you just see all these, your days blend and your time passes and you get old. And then you maybe one day you almost, you literally try to forget what you wanted to do with your life. I've had these conversations with people in their 60s and their 70s, and I will poke at them and poke at them, trying to get me to tell me, and then, then finally they'll start, you know, your voices change. All my poking at people happens over the phone, right, now on Zooms, and their voices change and all the rest of it changes, and then they'll admit they really wanted to do, it's almost always travel, by the way. Right. Yeah. And uh, they'll tell me that they wanted yeah. to have done this or done this or, you know, the other thing. And then I ask them, you know, in a roundabout sort of way, why are you giving up on that dream? And the answer that they come up with or the answers they come up with are almost always bullshit and they don't know it because what they're doing is they're using old software in their heads to normalize essentially um, growing old broke. And that's really what their answers are. Well, I'm too old. I can't do this. Look, some of them have you know health issues. 
self-induced health issues that they could probably do something about, right? Lose some weight and you'll lose the diabetes, generally speaking, right? Things like that you can do something about. Well, I would love to go walk around, you know, Florence, like we were just talking about and see the statue of David and see all the Medici buildings and see all the things that, you know, I've always dreamt about when I was, you know, maybe a kid back in college or whatever. And I never quite did it. I never had the money, all these excuses, right? And all of it makes sense, right? Started your family, had financial obligations and whatever. And now you can't do it. Why? Because you're too old. Well, where's that? What is that? What the hell does that really mean? You're too old. It means you're just being damn, you're just lazy. You've essentially allowed fear to ruin your life. Your world's gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually you're just going to be living under your own, you know, staircase. And you're going to be afraid to go out in the day. You're not going to want to do anything. You're just going to sit in front of the TV and the TV is going to tell you how you're supposed to think and feel. And at that point, you'll just be zombified. That's what's happening to a lot of you right now. You just don't know it. And you think, well, I can just basically coast. Everything will just be easy. I'll have everything delivered. You know, I'll just, you know, I'll work my centers of influence and past clients and I'll just write off into the, no, it's not going to work like that. The world's going to change at such a rate that unless you're willing, no matter what your age is, to change with it, you're going to be left behind. And by left behind, I mean it in the harshest of ways because that's how it works. That's how real life works. So unless you've got a bucket of money or you have some family member that's going to you know, toss a bucket of money on you, you're going to have a, you know, essentially your golden years aren't going to be so golden. They're going to be more like your 10 years, you know, <laughs> meaning. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? That's why the real estate gods invented your real estate license. And at least you were motivated enough to get that. So do something with it. I often remind coaching clients, think back to the day you got your license, how thrilled you were you passed that thing. You, the, you were going to light the world on fire. Get back to that thought. Well, so let's go back to talking about going to Florence. And so, again, I ask questions and I drill down and I drill down because I'm not going to let it go because I'm trying to help you, right, listeners? And then finally you say, well, my knees or my health or my this, the other thing. We move past the fear. You have a good laugh. I have a good laugh. You realize that really hopping on a plane and having a glass of Chardonnay and, you know, maybe some Xanax, basically, you can handle it. And so you're fly- you, know, you land in Europe and now your mind goes to your ego, by the way, then tells you, well, you won't be able to put up with the you know, the physical walking around. Well, guess what, guys? Why don't you start going on, you know, start out with short walks and make it into longer walks and start doing it every single day to get your physicality back in order. Remember, the three things that you can actually control Mm -hmm. are your environment, your physical, and your financial. That's all we're asking you to do. Stay in your own three-foot world. There was a great, many, many, many great seal books. Julie and I listened to those together. And um, I remember it was, oh man, I wish I could remember which one it was. Um, anyway, he was talking about when they were essentially when they're, uh, in these horrible extremes all over the planet, he was talking about having to walk with his seal crew, you know, his team through this like Arctic tundra or something was absolutely awful. I actually don't think that he he said where they were, Mm -hmm. which tells me they probably were in some place, not necessarily friendly to the United States, which would lead me to believe maybe someplace over, you know. But in any event, he would talk about they had to go for a long freaking walk. No, you know, I think it was Afghanistan in the winter or some bullshit. Yeah. And so they had to go through this long, horrible, snowy ass, cold, wind torn, uphills, downhills, rocks everywhere uh, walk. And they had to do it for a long period of time because they couldn't take helicopters in. It was Afghanistan. And he was um, uh, talking about the fact that what he did to keep himself motivated was he in the morning, you know, when he's when they started out, he just thought about lunch. And he focused Mm -hmm. on his next step. He focused on his own three-foot world. He focused on what was three foot around him. That's all his world was. He didn't think anything beyond that three-foot world. And then when lunch came, he savored lunch. He made it. He made it to lunch. You know, he he did it. And then this they sat out again further up this, you know, horrible mountain or wherever they were. And then now he's thinking about dinner. (laughs) Right? Dinner and going to bed. He's keeping it real, right? Exactly. He was controlling what he could control. He was controlling his mind, his environment. You know, it's three foot world. You got to start somewhere. And I, I think people get so intimidated trying to make it about something else that you can just let's make it about breakfast. That's okay. That's right. Imagine right. if imagine if he were basically him and his buddies were in that same environment. Imagine just a group of seals walking mm-hmm. some horrible environment with all their winter gear on. You know, their yep. white things, their goggles, yep. cold as hell, carrying this heavy pound. You know, these guys carry. Yeah. Ugh, um, I mean, an it's unbelievable an, amount of weight. It's it, they're superhuman, basically. You know, by the time they're operational, they are anyway. 
Uh, and then they're all basically listening to CNN or Fox News. Can you imagine? Right. They're, they're, they're hearing about all the social unrest and they're then debating it. They're wearing, you know, let's say they're wearing headgear and they're, they're talking in their mics and they're, yeah. they're having a little social uh, discourse on the, you know, meaning of this and the meaning of the other thing. I mean, that's well, insane, right? They would never do yeah. that. Okay. So just to relate this to one of my astronaut stories, he Uh-oh. was talking about, okay, Chris Hadfield again. He was talking about how when he, he actually has a section in the master class deal that's a chapter about the day you actually get to go to space. And he was talking about how he had thought about this day since he was nine years old and how you never quite allow yourself to believe because there's so many things that you have to do to be able to actually be allowed to go to space, not much less know what you're doing when you're going. So he was talking about all of the different things that go out throughout the day. You know, it starts with being quarantined for the week before because you don't want to be sick up there. And he, he said, you know, when the astronauts make the walk from the space station out to the, the van that takes them to the actual ship, he said they're all coached on how to wave to the media <laughs> because there's so, much, uh, so many cameras that not only do you not want to wave in front of your own face, but you don't want to wave in front of another astronaut's face because you're all supposed to be photographed, you know, photographed at the same time. And he talks about all these things that he has to, you know, go through his mind and he's dealing with the media and this and that and the other thing. And he says, and he's, th- he's thinking about, you know, they get up to the, uh, where they're entering and they're all handed letters from their family and like all of these, you know, this big buildup. It's a ritual. It's a, it's a ritual. And this, this is a tradition that's gone on for a long time. And then he says, and then you strap yourself to the rocket, and that is the only thing you think about. Yep. He said, it's over. The media's gone. You've got your letters from your family. That's it. You switch it off like that because anything can happen from that point. And he said, the next thing that happens is the countdown. And once it gets down to six seconds, the rocket is in control, and you can't bail if you wanted to. And he said, you better have your head screwed on straight at that point. So that's what your three-foot world reminded me of. That's it's right. It's like that mental control. You know, Napoleon Hill called that uh, PMA, positive mental attitude, and basically having control of your marbles. I think we all need a bigger dose of that these days. Why do people normal. feel inclined or obligated to participate in all of this, you know, you know, essentially mostly negative discourse. Yeah, it's a distraction. Well, but it's an excuse. Yeah, it's an excuse. That's right. Yeah. I think that's really what it I is. I can't do that because I'm too worried about this. Or, right. Exactly. You know, things we hear- will change tomorrow because I heard this on whatever news mm-hmm. station. I'm going to wait until basically, you're going to hear this from your customers too, guys. Well, I'm going to wait until after the election. Like somehow sure. that has something to do with something, you know. I'm going to wait to see, you know, what happens with, it's, it's all, decision. it's basically, but, but you guys see what's happening? That is the answer. It's indecision. When you're thinking and worrying about things outside of your control, you do nothing. Generally speaking, you're essentially living a life where you're a wash of fear and indecisiveness, and you're surrounding yourself with people and thoughts that are like that, and you don't do anything. Yeah, and but indecision causes inaction, and why are people indecisive? Because nobody's bothered to educate them about how to make a good decision, or which is the agent's job. It's not your yep. client's job. To sort through all of their real estate decisions. That's why the agent exists. And always will. Yes, that's right. So, you know, I had this discussion on uh, Premier. We need to probably wrap up before it's midnight. But yeah, um, <laughs> okay, I had this discussion a lot on Premier is that, you know, a lot of part of the inventory problem is that people don't know what they're going to do if their house sells. Mm-hmm. Solve the problem. Okay. Don't just take that as an excuse. Don't just take that as an, ob- oh, well, you're right. There's no inventory. Because that just perpetuates the whole thing. But, but I want to address that, though, yeah. okay? If the seller doesn't have to sell... Well, that's, if, that's different. It's right. a motivation thing. If you have a seller that has to sell, then... You they're going to solve their problem. Right, but they're going to not be so stuck on easily solved problems. Right. You, where you're going to find yourself burning yourself out is when you're sitting in front of the seller that wants to downsize or even upsize, but there's nothing pressing or nothing that's external right. that's forcing them to do it. And then you're going to kill yourself trying to get this yeah, essentially marginally motivated seller to somehow want to put their house on the market right now, um, even though they're fearful of not being able to find something. Now, if you can find them something, obviously, then maybe that's going to be a little bit easier. Or if you can essentially put them in construction, new construction, which we sure. definitely suggest all of you guys but, look but for. But that is an agent problem. Because right. Because they're killing themselves on leads like that. Right. Because it's the only leads they have. If you generate, you don't have to tolerate, exactly. which is also a Harris rule. If you generate listing leads, you do not have to tolerate. I mean, you can fill Less in the blank. Less motivated leads. 
well less motivated, time sucking, you know, soul destroying. We can, we throw can call it. them flaky leads, but ultimately it's not their fault that they're right. not motivated. It's your fault that you're not working with people who are motivated. And the only reason you're working with unmotivated uh, leads is because you don't know how to self-generate your own leads because it always goes back to the same thing. If you're beholden to buying leads, then you're never going to be free. If you're never going to be focusing on being a listing agent, you're never going to be able to produce enough positive cash flow to ever have enough profit to ever essentially, you know, be rich. And by being rich, I mean, well, here, I'll con consolidate it because Julie wants to go lay down. Mm -hmm. Go back and listen to the podcast I did last week where we're talking about the fact and leading up to the fact that you do have a moral obligation to be rich. I've got three more shows that are going to be rolled out this week. I'm looking forward to sharing those with you guys. I know I'm reaching a lot of you because you're telling me you are or telling me I am and I appreciate that. And these aren't just, you know, if you guys have noticed, Julie and I do not waste time on platitudes or mindset or silliness. We tell you exactly, very practical and tactically what to do, how to do it. We give you, you know, essentially what happens if you do and what happens if you don't take our advice. And when you do, or at least when you start adopting that mindset of being practical and tactical about how you face life in general, you'll find that life is a thousand percent less stressful. You know, it's, it's sort of like, it's, I was like Warren Buffett, right? You know, he never invests in things he doesn't understand. And let's assume that he understands a hell of a lot more than what all of us do That's combined. Right. right. But he won't invest in, say, for example, technology companies. He won't invest in things that he doesn't, that don't actually produce a profit. So he, what Warren's done over time to make himself, what, the third richest person on planet Earth is what he's done over time is basically he's set himself up to stay in his own three-foot world. He has set himself up to follow a certain set of rules and beliefs that he will certainly tell you about. He talks about them all the time. Julie and I learn a lot from him. Um, and where, really what it always circles is he does not deviate from his three-foot world ever. He, I actually, Julie and I have read so many things written by him or written about him. And there are historical examples where he has deviated, where he had his ass handed to him, and how those were sometimes the most expensive, you know. That's how you learn. <laughs> yeah, that's how you learn. But that's the reason he owns so much Coca-Cola. That's the reason he owns all the railways. That's the reason he owns all these big sort of, you know, foundational businesses, because he understands them. He's staying in his own three-foot world. He knows how profitable businesses are supposed to operate, that type of thing. That level of thinking you need to have. And what so many of you guys think you can do is somehow, like, I was listening to Peter Schiff podcast today, and he was talking about he is not a fan of Bitcoin. And every time I hear him get on a rant, and that guy rant, you guys think mm -hmm. I rant? Trust He's me. He's got a good rant. I, seriously. <laughs> I'm, I'm rank amateur compared to Peter Schiff when he starts talking about Bitcoin. He has he, rant stamina. <laughs> dude, it's amazing. Anyway, so when he's yeah. ranting against uh, Bitcoin, some of the things that he points out, are so preposterous that, that Bitcoin investors are actually believing to be true that it is shocking that it's legal, truthfully. You know, as far as the whole thing with people, you know, the, there's, there's so much absolute goofiness. It's a Ponzi scheme, basically. That's what Bitcoin truly is. And for him to like, it, he, he was explaining this morning, again, when I was waiting for Julia at the doctors, he was explaining how the people who are buying Bitcoin, like Bitcoin supposedly went up recently. I don't remember the exact specifics of it, but the gist of it was, is that it looks like people were using their stimulus checks to buy Bitcoin on speculation. And most of the people doing it, it were buying it uh, were millennials. So here you have people, millennials, people in their 20s, who you know damn well, they could have definitely used that 1200 bucks for something else other than speculating on Bitcoin. And that's what they were buying. That's what they were doing. Is that something Warren Buffett would have done? Is, no, no. they just think they're going to be able to hit a home run. They think that they're going to come up with some because they don't, they have yet to learn with essentially the foundational rule of life that all of us should have learned when we were in kindergarten, that ultimately, if you want ever increasing levels of success, it comes from doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. There's no shortcuts to it. There really aren't. There's no pill to swallow or there's no, you know, secret password. You guys remember the book, The Secret or the movie, The Secret? Mm -hmm. And they made it like their secret scrolls that were found and all these told all the secrets to how to get rich and all that. And so many of you guys just lap that stuff up and all that stuff is still floating around in some other different iteration now. And you're still believing it because you want to believe there's a shortcut. There is so much money, trillions of dollars yeah. every year being, you know, essentially made from selling people into a belief that there's a secret, that there's a shortcut. Isn't that fascinating? Smart people 
successful people know that there isn't, right? And I'll tell you what's more, smart, successful people, ethical people don't try to sell into other people into believing that there is a shortcut. They don't. That's true. And yet, that's what our industry is ripe with, right? All these people that are trying well, to sell. It's so much easier, right? I mean, wouldn't our podcast be a hell of a lot easier if we were just were like, hey, you know what? If you just do this, the world will rain leads on you. And then when that doesn't work, we'll just say, well, you haven't been at it long enough. That's right. You just need more impressions. Yeah. I mean, we're retooling our own business so in, much easier. <laughs> in anticipation of the changing market. I mean, we're dusting off the short sale. We're All the distressed stuff, you and I are bringing that back front and center. We're uh, going to launch an updated version of our website. We're increasing the uh, coaching. We're now going to do a lot more video coaching. We're just going through every single, even though none of, none of you have complained, there has been one, nobody, everyone loves the products that we create. Everyone loves the platform. Every, but I'm not going to wait around for you guys to say it's obsolete. We're going to be at least two or three here, years ahead of where we're supposed to be so we can over uh, deliver. That's really you know un- overwhelming uh, value is what we've always focused on. And that's what we do in our coaching, uh, as a lot of you guys already know, because you're in our coaching programs as it is. But look, in the meantime, I've got to give Julie a break. <laughs> hey, welcome back. Thank you. I look forward to our podcast next this week. Are you going to be on it tomorrow? I hope to be. Hmm. We'll see. We'll see. All right. So uh, homework today from listening to today's podcast is to um, please consider what we said and go media free. Challenge yourselves to go completely media free this week. I'm also going to challenge you, and I'm not going to get on a rant about this, but I would strongly suggest that you guys maybe also consider cutting out alcohol. A lot of you are over drinking. I was on three different Zoom meetings today with or this week with big groups, and I saw people drinking on Zoom meetings like they didn't know their cameras were on, and these were this was during the day. So obviously there's a lot of budding alcoholics that have essentially, you know, are, are essentially going to have a problem once the as they're out of their houses you know, and over the, drinking overeating you mm-hmm. know the pandemic is not your excuse to be lazy yeah that's all I was well but it was though for a lot it of people was, <laughs> but let's kind of pull out of this people yeah exactly so there it is guys do consider at least going media free and for those of you um who maybe are starting to develop more of an alcohol habit i would suggest you cut that out too for all kinds of other motivational and health reasons in the meantime if you guys want to talk to me about exp realty joining our exp realty team brokers agents certainly you know single agents just text me directly at 512-758-0206 god bless and have a fantastic day this podcast is a part of the c-suite radio network for more top business podcasts visit c-suiteradio.com